Good morning, church. Start by asking a question. You can raise your hand if the answer to the question is yes. I'm wondering how many of you have seen the show Dirty Jobs? If you're on live stream, you can wave your hand as well. All righty. Probably didn't think I was going to quite ask that question on uh, Christmas Sunday. The show, Dirty Jobs, is put together by a guy named uh, Mike Rowe. Mike's kind of the host. And it's a very interesting show. It's not a Christian show by any means. It's a very interesting show. If you haven't seen it before, basically Mike travels all around the world and he gets to know hardworking people. People who earn an honest living by doing some rather dirty work, meaning smelly work, uh, where you get your hands a little dirty. And so, for example, I uh, did a search on the internet this week and found out what Mike's five dirtiest jobs ever, in his opinion. And uh, so here's his list. First one is sewer inspector. Next one is snake researcher. And I had to look into that one. The reason that one is so much of a dirty job is that apparently snake researchers, they capture the snakes, they empty out the contents of their stomach, and then examine what the snake has been eating to do the research on the snake. Uh, another dirty job is cow inseminator. <laughs> Next is concrete chipper. And the last one, I didn't really see this one coming, but the last one is shark suit tester. <laughs> so yes, apparently that is a thing to dress up in some sort of a suit and then see uh, if it works. <laughs> so I suppose that either it does or it doesn't, it's pretty clear. Now the reason that Mike does this research, one, it really is very fascinating. It's interesting to see what good, honest, hardworking people do to make a living to provide for their families. But he doesn't set up this show so that we will laugh at these people or mock their industry. Actually, it's incredibly the opposite. Mike has a deep respect for working men and women, women who every day go to work and do some really difficult things, some really unfortunate parts of their task, but that is their job. And he has a high level of respect for them. Well, I share this opening illustration to get us thinking a little bit what it might have been like to be one of the shepherds, the shepherds in the Christmas story, the one that John just read for us, to kind of get their point of view and their perspective on Christmas, and that's actually what we're going to look at this morning. And what we'll find as we listen to the shepherds and watch what they're doing is we'll learn two important things about Christmas. And so before we dive into the text, I would invite you to please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Christmas story, for this text that has grown uh, familiar to many of us, uh, but precious, precious words as we remember this time in history when you, Lord God, did an incredible thing for us. As we examine it from the perspective of the shepherds, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand it even better, to think about it once again, and to ponder on the meaning and the significance uh, of what was going on there. So we ask now that you would please help us to learn, help us to grow in our faith, that we might better glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And we're going to start uh, kind of partway into the story, the part where the shepherds show up. Luke 2, 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And so this verse 8 tells us two significant things about the job, about the um, position of what it meant to be a shepherd. First of all, they did their work outdoors. This was outdoor work, right in the midst of their flocks. It wasn't like they brought them into the barn, so to speak, and took care of them there. They were out in the fields, uh, on the job. And they lived outdoors because that's where the sheep lived. That's where they would stay. And so they went and drew near to them. And so I would imagine as a shepherd, you became pretty adept at stepping over piles of droppings and watching out for urine spray from time to time. It was a bit of a dirty job. And I got a little friend here who's going to help me illustrate. 
that it was probably also kind of a cute job, kind of a fun job when the little lambs were born. But as cute as these little fellows might look to you and me, I think from a shepherd's perspective, it might not always be so cute and cuddly. Uh, In addition to the manure and the urine, there was probably also occasionally blood, either from one sheep biting another sheep or some other incident that might have happened, or when sheep were being born, lambs were being born, it probably got to be rather a bloody and messy affair. I would imagine all of this in addition to some of these little guys who would get away and eat something that maybe they weren't supposed to eat and then would start to throw up because they ate the wrong thing. And I don't know, I haven't been a shepherd, but I can only imagine at times it got to be a rather dirty job. And they did this right out in the open. Rain or shine, they had to be out there taking care of these sheep. There was no uh, indoor plumbing. There weren't flushable toilets. I doubt that there was a shower facility, so before they headed home, they'd take a quick shower before they got back. More than likely, when they got back from a day or several days or maybe even a week of work, they came back home. They probably had a a musty fragrance (laughs) to them, more than likely. The other thing that God's Word teaches us in Luke 2.8 is that their work was 24-7. It was night and day. This was not a nine-to-five job. It didn't have some of the conveniences that you and I might enjoy. Frankly, if it did, what would happen between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. is the sheep would get eaten. And then they wouldn't even have a job anymore because someone would come. These, apparently, these guys are pretty tasty. At least the animals thought so. And so the job was to watch over the sheep, to protect them not only from predators, but also from thieves, people who would steal them, because apparently people also enjoy sheep as well. Likely this group of shepherds, they worked as a team, especially overnight. Probably one of them would keep watch and stay awake while the others probably rested, and they would take different shifts and work together. It stands to reason that these shepherds were probably pretty tough people, pretty hardy folk, But they were also common folk. They were everyday people. Common people. All right, little fella, go find mom or dad. Don't eat that. Common folk. They probably didn't rank among the biblical scholars of the day. I doubt they were particularly popular or influential with the masses. I doubt they had training in speaking or they weren't practice orators. They weren't poets. They were not trained historians or court reporters. And I share all this again to get us thinking about who they were and what they were like, but I mention this because it begs the question, why? Why in all the world did God decide to send the angels to the shepherds? Why was that his plan? Certainly, there must have been better candidates, people who could have carefully recorded this, a very nice penmanship, and kept track of this professionally, written it down. People, again, who had influence with the masses, who could communicate this story with poise and a little more polish than the average shepherd probably had. I mean, after all, this is one of the most important events in all of history. Why did God pick these people? Common folk, simple, everyday people. Luke 2.10 says, But the angel said to them, these shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And I think it's in verse 10 that we may have our answer to the question of why. The shepherds remind us that Jesus came to save common folk. Plain, simple, regular, everyday people. People like you and me. Regular folks. That is why God sent his angels to a bunch of stinky shepherds out in the middle of nowhere. Normally when a baby is born, the first people to hear are the family and the close friends. But that was not the case with Jesus' birth. When Jesus was born, 
The shepherds were the first to hear. The angel brought them the news. These were people who represent all people. In other words, the earthiness and the commonness of the shepherds, it helps ground the Christmas story in this important reality that Jesus came to save common folk. That's who he came for. 1 Corinthians 1.26 reminds us, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Now, we could take offense at these words and be like, well, what is he saying about us? But that's not really the point. The point is Jesus came for all of us. And even his earthly ministry often focused on common folk. People, for example, like fishermen. Now, there's a dirty job. (laughs) There's a stinky job. He pursued those who were humble, who lived simple lives. He didn't need there to be anything particularly special or attractive or noble about them. We learn more about this good news in Luke 2.11. Today in the town of David, which is a reference to Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah the Lord. Verse 11 clarifies something about Jesus that's pretty interesting. Jesus is all three. He is Savior. He is Messiah. He is Lord. In fact, this is the only place in the New Testament where these three are brought together in one idea, in one verse. Savior, Lord, and Christ all appear together. Messiah. Lord means that Jesus has sovereign authority, that he is divine. By Messiah, we mean the anointed one, the one who is heir to David's throne. And by Savior, Jesus is our rescuer. He is the one who came to deliver us from our sin. So we see these three terms, these three ideas, all brought together just here in this one very powerful verse. And the shepherds are told who this is who has been born. Back in Matthew 121, the angel had told Joseph, you need to name him Jesus. The reason you need to name him Jesus is because he's going to save people. He's going to save his people from their sins. In fact, if you read through the different birth accounts, both Mary and Joseph, both are told, you need to name him Jesus. And we'll find out later in verse 21 that they do indeed name him Jesus. The reason for that is that the Jesus is the Greek form of the word Joshua, and Joshua means the Lord saves. There was no question as to the purpose of why Jesus came, to the identity of who he was. He was Savior, but it broadens here to think about him also as Lord and as Messiah. The thing that's interesting is that the shepherds didn't know his name. The angels didn't bother to tell them the address, the name of his parents, or the name of the kid. But what they did do is give them a sign, Luke 2.12. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That's how you'll find him, and that'll be the sign that he is the special person we're talking about. Now, back then, it was actually quite common to wrap a baby in cloths. That wasn't all that unusual. But a baby lying in a manger, that was not common. That was not the norm Shepherds were very familiar with mangers. After all, these were feeding troughs for animals, and they knew all about this. And so it must have seemed rather peculiar to them to go from hearing that Jesus was Messiah and Lord and Savior, and oh, by the way, you'll find him in a feeding trough. That probably piqued their curiosity, had them going, whoa, wait a second. So after listening to this huge group of angels who sounded like our beautiful choir this morning, I'm sure. Sing glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And then the angels leave. And the shepherds are standing there in the field and they say to each other, well, fellas, I'm going back to bed. I'm exhausted. I can't believe those angels came out here. I was fast asleep. It wasn't even my turn to watch the sheep and they made all this ruckus, made all this noise. Who's got the next watch? I'm going back to bed. Okay, that's not what they said. 
But they could have. They could have responded that way. They could have responded to this incredible news by doing nothing. Hey, that was cool and all. But I'm sure glad the angels left. Because honestly, that was freaky. That was really scary. And I'm not really into all this God stuff anyhow. It's just, that's just not my thing. And the fact is, not everyone is interested in God, is curious about the things of God. And it's really too bad because as we look at this story, the whole point here of Jesus coming to earth is to present this opportunity for all people to find this great joy. It's such a wonderful opportunity laid before us. Now we do learn what the shepherds actually did in Luke 2, 15 and 16. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. They're excited. They're running. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And Mary in particular, I think, may have been particularly alarmed or a little surprised about these shepherds showing up. I would think that she perhaps would have thought to herself or maybe even said out loud, what are all these shepherds doing here? Can a lady please get a little bit of privacy? I mean, after all, I just gave birth in a barn. Give me a break. The nativity set was getting a little crowded, perhaps. And I even wonder if Mary might have even whispered just a silent prayer, saying, Lord, why couldn't you send me somebody helpful, like a nurse or a midwife? Why did you send these stinky old shepherds in here? It smells bad enough. But there was a significant reason for why the angels told the shepherds to go and find the baby lying in a manger. Verses 17 and 18 tell us, when they had seen him, when they'd seen Jesus, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds were the spokesmen, the first ones to deliver this good news to other people. You see, Jesus didn't let the lives of these common folk remain common. Instead, he gave them a message. He gave them a testimony to share, this incredible good news. In other words, this good news that would cause joy for all kinds of people wouldn't cause joy for anyone unless someone told them. That's the only way we're going to cause great joy is by letting others know. And if these common folk, simple shepherds, who had at least a hint of manure and urine on them, if they can share the good news, certainly you and I can share the good news. The shepherds remind us that God wants common folk, just plain everyday people, to spread the good news about Jesus. Luke 2.18 says, All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But then verse 19, you'll note, Mary has a bit of a different response. This isn't one that I was kind of hypothesizing about. This is what the scripture says. Mary treasured up all these things, pondered them in her heart. And each of these reactions is understandable. It's understandable that we might need some time to think about all this. This is a lot to take in. A lot going on. And it's important for each one of us to sincerely reflect on the message of Christmas and what was happening and who this was and why he came and what his purpose was for us. You see, Mary also was hearing what the shepherds were saying. She saw their reaction. She watched their response and heard some of the words as they were excitedly talking to each other. Not just because there was a little baby, but because of who he was and what it meant. And even though Mary had a very unique role in the story and, and very much understood more than maybe most at that point, she was still mulling things over. 
She was still turning around in her mind. What is this? Who, who is this child I just gave birth to? And I had a sense, but oh my goodness, he's Messiah, he's Lord, he's Savior, and the whole world's going to know. It was a lot to take in. So it's certainly reasonable for you and I to need some time to ponder, to think it over, to process what this means. But eventually, each one of us, we need to decide how are we going to respond? What is our decision about all of these things? At some point, we need to move on from treasuring Christmas as this wonderful holiday to pondering some of the deeper theological ideas and significance, more than just celebrating the happy Christmas feelings and the hallmark moments where the snow is falling. Those are all fine. Those are good. They're part of the celebration. But one author puts it this way, the Christ who is born into the world must be born in your heart. The Christ who is born into this world needs to be born into our heart, each one of us individually responding. Jesus came into the world to save us. Do you believe that? Consider these wonderful words from the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. So will we be meek enough Will we be humble enough to admit our need for a Savior? And will we put our trust in Him, in who He is? If you do put your trust in Jesus this morning, it will be a cause for great joy. Your own great joy, but great joy for those around you. That's the Christmas story, that's the Christmas message. Salvation from sin, it's a rescue mission that brings joy, freedom from sin. Jesus' birth was first announced to simple shepherds. None of them were anyone special. We never even learned their names. We never hear about them again. They're just some guys who are out working one night, doing their jobs. And yet they were so important to God that he wanted to make sure that they had ample opportunity to hear this good news, this opportunity for them for great joy in their lives. So why not put your trust in Jesus today, this morning, whether you're watching on live stream, whether you're here in the sanctuary or in our overflow space, it's something to ponder, something to consider. Now the shepherds, they did put their faith and confidence in what they'd heard, but they did first investigate it and they experienced it personally for themselves. And once they did that, they had two particular responses. One was to tell other people. This was exciting. They spread the word. And the other was to praise and glorify God, to respond to this wonderful gift of God from heaven, to respond in praise and worship. It's a great way to spend our Christmas season. Luke 2.20 tells us the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Just as they had been told back in verses 11 and 12, that when they found this baby lying in a manger, he was the Savior, he was Messiah, he was Lord. Just as they had been told he was wrapped in cloths and he was lying in a manger, just as they were told that's how they would find him, that is how they found him. And they believed. They didn't just happen to be in the right place at the right time and all of a sudden, wow, hey, sure glad we happened to be there. But God sent this group of angels specifically, intentionally to them at this time. Much like God may be sending this church and this sermon and this message to you right now, wherever you are at this time. Intentionally. Because he cares. 
God wanted these shepherds to be the first to hear this news, to investigate its accuracy, and then to proclaim it to others. In other words, the shepherds just didn't have a cool story to tell like, hey, angel sighting, let me tell you about this. They didn't simply snoop around and go, oh, look at the cute little baby. Everybody loves cute little babies. But they placed their faith in the facts that they were presented. And they responded by witnessing to others, by worshiping and praising the Lord. So dear friends, each one of us, we have the opportunity to be part of the absolute best parts of Christmas. So let's receive him. Let's believe in our Savior. Let's spread the word to others, and let's glorify and praise the Lord. Amen? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christmas can be such a great time that causes such great joy. In our hearts, in our minds, help each one of us to turn to you in faith. May our spirits truly overflow with worship, with a desire to give you glory and praise because that's what you deserve. That's our response of your love demonstrated toward us. And Lord, we pray for those of us who already believe and are following that you would give us opportunities this week to spread this good news that it will cause great joy for people all throughout Bemidji and around the world. We ask this together now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.